Thanks for downloading Pave the Way Podcast. On this show, your host, Greg Helbeck, interviews the top minds in real estate, business, and personal development to help you crack the code so you can grow your business and, more importantly, grow your life. Get ready for another game-changing episode. If you want to learn how to master your day and become a productivity monster, download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's Pave the Day, spelled D-A-Y, dot com. Now it's time for today's episode. Enjoy. All right. Dean Rogers, man. Welcome to Pave the Way Podcast. I'm excited to have you on. Thanks for having me, man. Let's do this. Yeah, bro. I, I know we had a lot of the same friends for a while. We never connected. And uh, what it took, it took like, you know, probably a couple of years. And, and, and finally, through pickleball, we've been able to meet uh, in pickleball person. Pickleball brings people together. Yeah, it's funny because I remember just seeing your name and I'm like, I need to meet this guy. I really need to meet this guy. But I'm not just going to like, even though I've done this before, I just didn't feel like I should Facebook stalk you and be like, Hey, let's hang out. You yeah. Know, so. yeah. Dude, <laughs> uh, I'm, so, I'm like the same way, dude. I, I, I need an intro, like a bridge through somebody versus. Right. Yeah. 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 So, so pickleball was, uh, was the means to, to bring us together and, uh, what better way to get sweaty together, rub shoulders and, you know, get some wins together. That's fun. Yeah, for sure. By the way, for all the listeners, Dean's a pretty good pickleball player because he'll tell everyone about his background in a minute. Uh, he has uh, some experience playing pro sports. So, uh, Dean, I'm, I'm really impressed with your real estate journey. I mean, I know you, you know, we live in San Diego, but I've also heard you on other people's podcasts in preparation for this. So I've been able to hear, you know, how, you know, you started your business. So if the listeners are not familiar with you, uh, can you give everyone just like the high level overview on what you did before you became a full-time investor in California? Yeah. So I'll give the cliff notes. So, you know, growing up, I was a sports guy through and through love sports. It's all I did. It's how I identified as my person, you know, I'm, I'm a sports guy. Um, so life was pretty simple playing sports, going to school, that kind of stuff. Um, in college, you know, I was, was playing football in college, um, on scholarship and had scouts looking at me and, you know, always been my dream. Like, you know, look back at the stuff in school. What do you want to be when you're older? I put pro athlete, like I believed in myself then, like, this is, this is what my life's going to be. And so, but once you get to the college level and you're getting, you know, scouted by NFL scouts, you're still not sure like a hundred percent, because it's not like I was a, a runner up to the Heisman or, you know, the starting quarterback at, uh, you know, LSU or, you know, name, name another good Alabama, know, Ohio Alabama. State. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm still kind of like on the fringe of like, uh, is this really going to happen? Um, yeah. But naturally I had like all the accolades, first team all American and all that kind of stuff in college as playing as tight end. And so, um, you know, lo and behold, flash forward to just out of college, uh, did all the, the, the pre pro training stuff, training with other NFL guys, training for the combine, all the testing stuff, talking to, um, all the NFL, uh, scouts, you know, leading up to the draft and everything like that. And, uh, you know, it was the year of the lockout. So as soon as the draft happened, it was like radio silence, another six months of training of having no idea what's going to happen. And once the lockout lifted, you know, soon after I got the call from the chargers, and they're like, Hey, you got your bags packed. And it was literally like, Hey, it's four o'clock in the afternoon. You're getting on a plane at six in the morning tomorrow and you're starting your career now. <laughs> like dude, there's, so there's silly. no warm up. It's like, Hey dude, yeah. show up. We're going to, you know, go through, um, you know, medical, check your body, make sure you're not broken as you show up, um, to camp. And, uh, you know, if you check out good, we're going to give you your pads, get all your gear and we're starting practice today type of thing. Like, it's pretty crazy. Dude, um, that's so dope. So, yeah, I've got uh, tons of stories, you know, about being in the NFL um, that are just crazy, you know, like stuff you see on TV. It's like, well, that, that, that's like, uh, that's movie stuff, but that's for real. Like, yeah, that crazy stuff happened and everything you could imagine, just like the first class stuff with money being thrown around stuff, exclusive events, VIP status, red carpet type of stuff to just like insane uh, sports illustrated models just showing up out of nowhere uh, to events and like going up to people. Um, just 
lots of crazy stuff, you know? Um, and for me, just being in that environment, there's certainly the stuff. Cause I'm, I'm a pretty like straight and narrow guy. Like I like to have fun. I'm a goofball, but there's just certain things that like my moral code isn't going to do, you know, yeah, same. So there, there were things that I stayed away from, um, that are temptations, but then just, just the treatment, like my body had never felt better. Um, the, the nutrition, the, 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 the sports, tra- you know, the trainers taking care of your body, um, the, the trainers for working out and stuff like that. My body had never felt better. And, you know, North Turner was stopping me in the hallways, telling me you're going to have a long career. Like I, I was making it, dude. I was like living my dream, you know, and everything from the neck down felt amazing. And I was playing great everything, but from the neck up, I truly was feeling it because, um, I went from playing tight end to playing fullback for the chargers and primarily fullback. So, um, and they used me as like a skill player as some teams would, where they'd put me out, um, you know, to run routes and run routes in the backfield and hand the ball off. But your main position is to go destroy people that are 10 yards away in like a small narrow gap that you're both trying to get to full speed, trying to kill each other. So if you do the math on that, there's a car crash that's happening every time there's mass destruction happening. And if you're running through a narrow gap, chances are you're not like fitting up perfectly and you're going to be crushing in your head a lot. So that was the reality. Um, you know, I'd come out of practice sometimes like I see my head, like, uh, I need to help myself recover (laughs) from my brain too, um, which was kind of low key scary. You know, um, I saw some dudes that had been in it for a while. Some of the vets, uh, junior Sal killed himself that year. Um, yeah, man. He was on the Chargers, right? He, he was on the Chargers, Chargers and he had a long yeah. career. He was in the, the league for like 14 or 15 years. He had a run with, um, you know, the Chargers. He had a run with the Patriots, uh, you know, in their championship years. And so he had been around in, in a stud and just remember seeing him come into practice. And now that he was retired and talking to us and, you know, kind of giving us speeches and later that year killed himself. So um, there were just things that for me were kind of the writing on the wall, ESPN was finally starting to talk about concussions. And it was like, I remember that. Yeah. And um, that was before I, the chargers even called me during the lockout when I was training in Fresno with a, with a handful of other NFL guys. And I was just like, uh, you know, I should think about this, <laughs> you know, dude, that's so, so cool. It, it was a trip, dude. Um, it was an incredible experience. It was for me. Um, I think, the more I've talked about this recently, the more I've kind of realized how I feel about it. Um, there's that feeling of like, I missed out on not having a long career because I certainly feel like I could have. Um, but there's also the feeling of fulfillment to know that, all right, I got there. I know I can play at that level. And I also know that I'm not going to be, you know, bedridden at the age of, you know, 40 to 50 because like my brain just stopped working because I did so much damage to it. You know? Yeah, totally. And that's, that's the thing I remember, like I, I used to watch a lot of football and I remember they started talking about concussions and the mental health and all that stuff. And it was like, you know, cause everyone's like, oh, the NFL, like it's, it, it is obviously the, the, the best football league in the world, but there's, there's positives and negatives to everything in life. And it, it's, it's smart that you made the decision to, to, you know, take so your health hard, first. It was the hardest oh. decision I've, I've ever made because I'll still wake up like having a dream. And I'm, yeah. st- I'm there, I'm in the locker room with the dudes before a game or something like that. And I'll wake up super excited. Like my heart's pumping. I'm like ready for the game. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude. <laughs> and, uh, and it just, it's a trip because, um, that was, that was such a big moment. But, uh, for me, I just, I knew I made the right decision being on this side of the fence, you know, hindsight's yeah, always 2020, 20, but still it's tough. Cause it was, it was just an amazing thing to experience. And, and accomplish. And so, yeah, it was just, it's a cool thing to talk about and think about. You know? Yeah, bro. That it, It's interesting. I obviously I was not playing pro sports, but I played hardcore hockey, high level hockey, you know, junior level hockey, which is like, you know, probably eight steps below the NHL, but my whole identity, this is where I'm trying to get to with this. My whole identity was an athlete. And when that train stopped and I had to shift, you know, I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was like hopeless for a little bit. Like I didn't yeah. know what to do. Cause I'm like, I'm Greg, the hockey player. That's what everyone knows me about. How the, f- 
how the fuck am I going to start over? What am I going to do now? And like, it was a whole problem. And it, I'm sure you went through a similar thing where you're just like, holy shit, now what? Well, by the grace of God, for me, I actually didn't go through that. Um, okay. I fell right into working right away and just took off right away. I think for most people, that's yeah. probably the scariest moment. Cause I remember just looking at the eyes of some guys in college, knowing it was their last game. So yeah, I, man. There was no hopes or dreams or potential for anything else. And so it was like, this is it. And that's all that you had been and been doing forever. Yeah. You yeah. Um, so I was fortunate to not go through that. Um, I, I think one of my, my best friends to this day, uh, who I played college football with, he actually called me and was like, Hey Dean, I know you're done playing. You know, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to figure things out. He's like, dude, I got an opportunity for you. I'm working at this company in San Francisco. It's this tech company. They're about to go public. And like, you, this is what they're all about. I was like, whoa, that sounds like exactly what I want. And uh, so he literally walked me in the door to the recruiter, got me an interview. And as soon as I had that interview, I was instantly hired. And it, that could not have been more easier. That was a blessing in itself too, because I then on the other side, once hired, saw people show up and go through like gauntlets of interviews on Fridays for eight hours and like maybe get a chance of a, a continued interview from there. But just because of my friend and his, his position and, and uh, where he was at in the company, he was able to walk me in essentially. So um, that was like, right. That was immediately, that was like immediately, uh, I don't know, six months after I was done playing, um, walked me right in the door and started from there. And that kind of to shift focus, I remember starting my professional working career as a, I'll call it a civilian. I like to kind of like, um, like the military <laughs> relate with the military folks. Yeah. It's like, there's, there's people in the military who know and have lived and experienced and understand what it's like to be in the military. And then there's, there's just civilians, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. They, everyone and else. They, yeah. They don't get they it. Wake up, they sleep that, you know, it's different. Yeah. Um, so I kind of identify like that, where it's like being an athlete and a pro athlete to them being a civilian. I remember going to work and I'm like, this is easy. I'm like, I just have to wake up and just show up and sit down at this desk and <laughs> slap these Take keys. The phone up. <laughs> this is so easy. And I had, I still had so much energy and, uh, was still all jacked up and everything like that and huge. So I just thought it was the easiest thing in the world. So I worked my ass off. That's all. That's what I know how to do best is work really hard. And so, you know, worked my ass off for a little over a year and just remembering going into the kind of uh, performance evaluation conversation. And I was like, oh, well, dude, they saw what I'm all about. I'm going to get a big raise. This is cool. This is great. This is super easy. They're like, great work, man. You're killing it. You know, we'll increase your salary from 65,000 to it was like 67,000 or something like that. I was like, okay, so I went from a contract for $1.25 million to $65,000. I worked my ass off and they're rewarding me with a couple thousand bucks. This is bullshit. Yeah, bro. I'd so be the same way. I remember going back to my little studio in San Francisco and Googling how to get started in real estate. You know, I kind of had that heart to heart moment. What are things that I'm passionate about? And I just remember the Dean Graciosi see late night infomercials and like almost buying his course a couple of times. I was like, you know, I really like real estate and it's an industry that, you know, is really broad in a lot of ways to make money. So long story short, man, just Google how to get started. I found Sean Terry's flip to freedom. Dude, podcast. Same here, bro. His flip to freedom in Phoenix, dude, that is yeah. what like got me really into the business, man. I, so you I felt like he was like my father or something. Now. Yeah, dude, yeah. for real. Yeah. I, I've studied it religiously, uh, or I should say followed, followed it because I was just listening to audio and yeah, yeah, I same. obsessively <laughs> listened obsessively to the point where his content was so good and so precise. Like he would review his contract. Again, I'm not visualizing this. I'm just listening. So I'm, I'm going through and taking notes. I remember waking up once or twice at like two in the morning because I couldn't stop thinking about it. And my body woke me back up and I went back to sitting in my tiny studio where my wife's sleeping and listening to the podcast with my headphones on just because I had to like listen to it again. 
So I was like a junkie on this and was following everything to a T. And from 90 days, three months from the first day I listened to it, uh, that day I Googled it, I closed my first deal. And the cool part about the story of closing my first deal in three months was it was actually with Sean Terry. So I was following exactly what he was saying in his market. So I'm living in California. I'm following it in Phoenix and bidding on properties, get it under contract, couldn't find a buyer. I contact, uh, I, I submit my information on his website. So his acquisitions guy calls me. No like, way. Oh, what's the deal? And uh, so he's like, I said, oh, I want to co-wholesale this. And he says, uh, oh, well, Sean, Sean should be able to take care of that. So he um, puts me in contact with Sean. We get on the phone. Yeah, no problem, dude. I'll take care of that. So then he sells it. We, he makes, you know, we make 12 grand. We split it. I make six grand. He makes six. And I was like, hell yeah. Dude, so you, you, that's see, no one talks about that. So you actually listen to his podcast, which, which most people don't like to do. They'll stay stuck in their job forever because they don't want to change. Yeah. Not only did you listen to the podcast, I just, there's a, there's always construction going on in my house. Couldn't even hear it. You're good. Okay. Uh, anyway, so um, then you listen to the podcast, you take action, which is rare. Most people don't do that. And then on top of that, you did a deal with probably the most famous real estate podcaster. Uh, in his own market, which is awesome. And that's direct, you know, directly adding value to him. Like, yeah, oh, my listener brought me a deal and he split 12 grand. Like that's, that's pretty cool. You know, especially yeah, as your first. Yeah. Deal. Super awesome, man. So it was pretty wild. Um, and that was just like that confirmation that it was real, you know, and, totally. uh, and that I, I could do this. Cause I was like, this is, this isn't too hard. It's a lot of effort and a lot of little pieces that come together that I got to yeah. figure out. Um, but as I just took action, like you said, I was able to put all the pieces of the puzzle together and learn from there and grow from there, you know? Dude, that's awesome. So high level over. So that's how you got, a, got your foot in the door. I know you've done real estate deals. You, so let me just, I'll give the listeners some context. So you live in San Diego near me. Your business operates primarily in between, from Bakersfield to Fresno, that whole Central Valley, correct? Yeah. Okay. The whole Central Valley, which... You know what's interesting about it? Because I never really considered or thought about this whole concept of being a virtual investor. Yeah, yeah. I did it like by accident. Did it by accident. Ago. I yeah. did it by um, starting it, right? I knew that when I got that shit raise, that my lifestyle was not going to get to where it once was and where I hoped and dreamt it to always be. Because I've always had the, the feeling like... Um, I, I want to put a lot on my shoulders and I want to reach these big goals and dreams. And I want to provide an amazing lifestyle for my family. And like, I'm that guy, you know, like I love I'd that. Always, I'd always excelled in sports. And so I felt the sports was going to get me there, right? Like, Hey, I'm going to make it in the NFL, get a big contract. And I'm going to buy, you know, everyone in my family, a house, everyone's going to be taken care of. So once that, that chapter had pretty much closed and I was now in the working world, I was like, well, this job isn't going to get me there. Yeah. There's gotta you know, be another way. Gotta be another way. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, starting in San Francisco, I was just so intimidated by the city and not knowing the, the real estate market there. Um, and just the real estate's different than where I grew up. If I had grown up in a city type environment, then those big buildings that are really expensive wouldn't have really intimidated me. But I grew up in neighborhoods where the houses are, you know, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollar houses, and so these shit box million dollar teardowns were pretty intimidating to me. And so oh, yeah. I naturally, again, followed Sean Terry and his market, which felt similar from a, a price point and style of houses to the Central Valley. Um, and then once I, you know, did a couple deals in Arizona, I then was like, okay, I I'm ready to do this in California and my market. I'm not going to do it in San Francisco where I'm living. So I, I went back to where I grew up, which is where I grew up in the central Valley and focused my marketing there and, you know, took off and it always felt natural because I knew the streets. I knew what the people were like. I, I can yeah. reference the high school I went to all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, to your point, I was a virtual investor from day one Yeah, and, and met my business partner, um, after a year of being in the business, 
We started flipping houses. He essentially was the boots on the ground. Yeah. Still doing acquisitions virtually and everything. And then um, once I realized it was so cold in San Francisco and I wanted one of the good life, we moved back to San Diego to, to warmer weather and again, been virtual the whole time. That's so awesome, bro. It's been fun. So do you, do you, uh, what, what, I, I may ask you this. So, so I don't know the Central Valley at all, right? I, I just know San Diego and LA and all that stuff. Everyone thinks from, I'm from the Northeast. Everyone's like, oh, California. Oh, it's so expensive. I'm like, yeah, you're t- I'm, Southern Cal is expensive, but most of California, like inland is reasonable. So like your, your market, like what is the average price point? Like 350, 400, right? The average, the, the median price Fresno? points are going to be yeah. in, in the mid twos um, up to the threes. Oh, wow. Okay. The, Even the cheaper. Median. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, they're going to be, they're going to be in the, the mid twos to the threes. If you were to Google it, it's probably really close to three plus or minus. So 300,000 bucks. I mean, that's a, a, a move in ready, nice house. You know, if you're talking medium price point houses. So when it comes to um, investment properties, most of those are going to live our average. I just did it. 2021, 105 closed transactions. The median, uh, the average price point of the purchase price was like 149 or something like that. Okay. So the price average price point has moved up a little bit over the past couple of years before it was like in the mid one twenties or something. Yeah. Um, so taking a poll from 105 houses we closed in 2021 average price point 149 is the purchase price. Um, and then most of the exits on those are going to be in the, the low mid twos. Yeah. Um, and we're still finding rental properties and some other flips that we're able to pick up below a hundred thousand bucks, you know, here and there. That's amazing. That's amazing. Are you, that's interesting. You say that because I, I started buying rentals. I'm from New York. Most of our businesses in New York, we do a handful of deals in, in San Diego, but I've found that the more of these rentals I buy, the more trouble I get into with the, the landlord laws in New York, but just because like I, I buy with bad tenants because I get these deals yeah, and we end up just getting into these like crazy, like eviction cases. So is that the same thing in the Central Valley or is that more like LA and San Francisco? Cause like, I feel like in your area, even though I don't know it, it seems more business friendly for California. I'll be clear about that. Yeah. Or is it still the same bullshit? It's a much more conservative crowd for yeah. sure. Unfortunately, they still follow the same state laws. That's true. So Can't change when that. it comes to evictions, it's still the same. I'd say, you know, you're probably dealing with more local conservative judges and stuff like that. So they're not going to deal with as much crap, but it's still the same song and dance when it comes to getting people out who are just like, you know, screw the system. I'm staying here. Uh, <laughs> you big, mean, rich landlord. I'm going to take advantage of you. Oh, and yeah. I really don't know what it's like to own a business and deal with expenses. And oh, by yeah. the way, our business is paying all these taxes to support the things that you're probably taking advantage of. Um, thanks for staying in that property. And, and <laughs> for me. So. It's, funny, it's funny you say that. I, I always say every to every tenant, they never know I own the property. I'm always the property manager. I don't really I, I've heard involved. you say that. I've heard you say that, which is. Oh yeah. Cause I don't want them knowing I'm the, the big cheese, even though I'm nobody, but uh, yeah. I, I'm always like, listen, I, I know that you want to stay and I wish you could stay, but here's how it's going to work. I know that you can't pay the market rent and I'm not kicking you out right now. I will let you stay for free for a couple months, but here's what's going to happen. If we don't come to an agreement, I'm going to give this money that I'm willing to give you to the attorney. So if you want this money and I'll pay for a moving truck too. So this is the offer. I would love for you to take it. I think it would really benefit you. But if this is an offer you're going to decline, I will get the attorney involved and this money will be going to the attorney and then eventually you will leave the property. So which would you like to do? And you, it's funny. You think a logical human would, would take an offer like that, but I always get the attorney and I'm like, Hey, Kara, let's get a new one on the board. You know, it's like a new contract, like a new eviction case. So uh, it's funny how that works. I did an eviction in Texas one time and the guy was literally out in two weeks. It was crazy. Two weeks. Oh, Notice on the door, got out of there. No problem. And it was just like, wow. But I'm uh, jealous. Yeah, for sure. So I want to talk about some things that you're doing in your in your business. But before that, I know that you have also, you've done some business down in San Diego, correct? I know you've done some fix and flips down here. Deals, so yeah. how was your experience operating in, in, in like Southern California, where it's a little different than, uh, you know, the, the Central Valley where, you know, the prices are higher down here? Because I've done some so, business here too, and it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough, bro. 
So here's my here's my story. It's it's not a, it's, a, it's not a fairy tale story on my my ventures fairy in San Diego. Story. <laughs> it's quite the opposite. So I'm excited to hear I, it. I've done like a handful and a half deals in San Diego. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I got experiences from from all. So okay. I've made money and I've lost money. So the ones I made money, they were. Um, deals I flipped and did JV deals with other people. Cause again, I wanted to kind of get my feet wet with other people mm -hmm. that in theory knew what they were doing. Um, each one of those didn't do as well as had anticipated. And okay. the first one, for example, was in ocean beach, did a flip there, okay. beach house, coastal style, um, small little place, but selling again for, you know, really expensive. And, um, it, it was one of those ones where the comps are so, so unique and specific yes, to where dude. if you're one block over, yes. oh man, you're, 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 it's, it's raining money and a big payday. Ooh, that one block right there. Yeah. About that. It's, you know, totally, the bro. same house, same look, same everything. Yeah. That's going to be, you know, $70,000 less. Um, so came out alive on, on our first one that we did, did not hit the numbers we expected. Um, but again, made a profit and it was like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess, uh, I guess we learned on that one to be careful. Um, yeah. and so that's, that's something that's tricky about kind of like those coastal kind of properties. Every little street can really make the biggest difference. Did you have to deal um, with the coastal commission on that too? No, because we weren't moving walls or doing anything okay. like that. It was just all interior cosmetic yeah. stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. That's a nightmare. Yeah. I could. Yeah. I've heard stories. <laughs> so, Only place you don't need the coastal commission, by the way, is Coronado, which you think it would, you would huh. need it there. That's the you only place. Would, you think that would be wildly uh -huh. controlled. Yeah. You don't need it in Coronado. That's the only place, which Wilder. is it's literally on the water. Anyway, so. It's surrounded by water. It's a peninsula. That is true. Yeah, that is true. There's that military base there. So anyway, yeah. so you did a deal in OB. So you're just, so these are all fix and flips. So you're not doing, this was an assignment. All, these all fix and flips. No, I did one assignment. The best deal I've ever done in San Diego, hands down. <laughs> it took no effort. Uh, it. it was a $40,000 assignment deal in San Diego. Um, I love it. Posted it on Instagram and, and Facebook. Immediately got hit up, oh. closed it in, you know, a week and a half. Super easy. And it, it came from a referral as well. It was just a complete layup and couldn't, couldn't have done any, couldn't have been any easier, you know? So that. that's, that's my, my, uh, my investment in San Diego story. I'll stick to, you know, but the, uh, the cry your eyes out story oh. is, is the one where, uh, you guess you could set the premise with, it was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay? <laughs> now this dude happened to be in our trusted circle of people. Okay. Um, okay. I'll, I'll leave names of people out. I'll leave groups of people out, but there was a group of people. There's a big group of people, very trusted, very respected, and pretty much the quality of all people in this type of group yeah. is on the up and up, just good, legit people. Well, this dude was one of those, let me get in this good group of people and take advantage of as many as people. And oh, dude. the punchline is he took people for millions of dollars and his deal, his, his strategy would basically Bro. buy a shit, a shit flip where the numbers didn't make sense, but he was such a good con artist that he would convince the hard money lender to get in on the deal and lend the money. He'd borrow the money from someone else, like bring the gap money, bring in the gap money, right? Yeah. Uh, and additional rehab or even extra money. He'd get like seconds or thirds on properties. Oh God. He wouldn't record the seconds or thirds, oh, even though he said he would. Dude. And, and the numbers would basically pencil out to like in best circumstances, maybe break even on the property. Um, maybe even a little bit of loss, maybe even a little bit of profit and got lucky on some deals. Yeah. So most of his deals were absolute garbage. And again, whoops and sheep's clothing. Oh, shouting from the mountaintops. We're making all this money. You know, all this money's coming in from all these different places. He's got all these projects going up. So my sob story where I got involved was he had a new construction project. Where was it? What neighborhood? It was, it was in Vista. 
Oh, that's not too far from me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, there was two lots, one right next to each other. He was gonna read. He was gonna do one himself, and and he was willing to sell the one next to it. It's like, cool. Well, that gives me extra security. I'm not familiar with new construction, but the numbers look really good. And uh, he's gonna do his right next to me. You know, he can do my project, and like this will be pretty simple. I feel good and comfortable about this. Yeah. So, Punchline on that one is. It was all just a house of cards. The hard money lender who he had in place and had agreed and green lighted the fact that I was going to come in and own that other lot had no idea I was coming in. Um, he had already taken a big draw on, oh. on um, you know, fees and costs that he had incurred for entitlement fees and uh, architect fees. By the way, he had had those people do work for him, but never paid them. So there was outstanding payments due to those people. So it was the biggest shit, sh shit show. Um, he ended up bailing on the project. Okay. Um, oh, bro, that's so, that sucks, bro. Super sucks. Oh. So long story short, I owned a nice piece of dirt on a nice corner lot in a nice neighborhood yeah. that not one piece of dirt was moved for the year, year and a half that I owned it. By the time I sold it and, you know, negotiated down payments for all these different uh yeah different leans all over the thing dude um, that's a disaster bro. renegotiated the loan and had to re-up on it do all these different things i lost Fuck. 187 thousand bucks dude on that deal that's a big that's, ouchies right there that's that's a fucking <laughs> blow dude can you imagine dude losing 187 grand now i've heard other people that have told me stories of losing a million bucks yeah yeah but that's dude that's a big fucking whammy because that's that's a, that's a lot of money dude. yeah that's a lot of, i don't care how rich someone is that's a lot of cash i don't like lose i just lost 10 grand on a deal last week and like that sucked right and it's like yeah and that's i mean listen if someone's just getting started and they lose 10 grand that could fuck them up right but but 180 yeah what, what was let me ask you this obviously this, i think you might this is an obvious question but from that big catastrophe if you had to boil down one lesson besides the obvious oh, of know lessons. who you're doing, what's, what is your, like your, your, maybe your two or three biggest lessons from that whole, you know, they call that seminars. I hear my friend yeah. when they lose money, they go, Oh, I had a seminar last a week. Learning lesson, like, yeah. Yeah. Seminar. Yeah. It was an education. <laughs> VIP ticket for, for you. A VIP <laughs> ticket, you know, fast pass. Wrote a check for an education instead of college. You know, I went to masters. I went, I got, went and got my masters. I wrote a check right there. 187 grand. Yeah. So the biggest lesson, and honestly, I beg, I beg people, everybody, no matter what, no matter who it is, do the due diligence. And what is due diligence? You know, oh, check out the, the repair estimator that it makes sense. Oh, ask them that, you know, are you sure these numbers are right? Which I did a million times. Take the extra step, just one extra step. All I had to do is make one extra phone call. Cause I relied on the facts that this one person was giving me solely. If I made one extra call to the hard money lender, Hey, you know what? That's cool. They're on board with me joining. Let me call them. I know exactly who they are already. Yeah. Why wouldn't I call them and say, Hey, so I just want to get the full story here and make sure I understand what the expectations are. Wait, what? Uh, he already took a draw. Um, you're not on board with this deal. Oh, well then this deal isn't for me. Click. I just saved yeah. 187 bucks by one more phone call. So the biggest yeah. lesson is if you're doing something outside of your comfort zone or a deal that you're not doing every single day, and you're just like a hundred percent certain of, right? Like these wholesale deals that we're just cranking out on a regular basis. We did, you know, 105 closed transactions last year. Those are all deals that I do every single day. The confidence is, you know, 10 out of 10. I know yeah, yeah, yeah. The deals that it's like, hmm, I'm not familiar with this. Or, uh, oh, this I'm working with this other person I'm not used to working with. Make that one extra call. If it's a contractor, you know, that you're about to start work with, get some referrals. Uh, tell me three other investors you work with. Let me call them and, and find mm -hmm. out the experience. Yeah. Oh, that guy was a real dirtbag. You know, he did crap work. And, um, he ended up walking away from the job. Oh, thanks for saving me money. You know, yeah, right. there's, there's <laughs> made that projects. mistake, dude. Oh, there's some God. projects I could have saved some serious money on with that exact, uh, exact example, making the additional call. So anytime I've lost money on a deal, which has been a handful of times, it's always because I didn't make that 
extra phone call. Dude, that is such good advice. And it's similar. You're saying stuff that I know and I've experienced the hard way. Every time I've done a stupid deal, I actually lost money in California too. Not to the extent that you did. I mean, that's, 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 that's extremely famous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, this was like a little like, you know, paper cut, but uh, I, I got involved in a deal. I didn't understand in Julian. I had no fucking clue what I was doing. Yeah. Did a seller carry deal. I had no, I dude, I literally have never done a seller finance deal in my life. And up to the point I probably did, I don't know, 90 deals. And I'm like, oh yeah, seller finance, no interest. Cool. And dude, lost money, bought a commercial building, no idea what I'm doing, lost money. And I'm like reflecting on it. I'm like, you know what? Every time I get involved in a deal that I don't understand, I need, like you said, I needed to do the extra homework and I yeah. didn't because I was excited about the deal. Oh, this is right. cool. No interest. Oh, I got this mixed use building. I'm the next commercial tycoon. It's like, no, stick to what you know, like stick to the flips, stick to the assignments, stick to the rental, fam- the single family rentals. Like people like to poo poo the wholesale business and the single family rental business. And I'm like, what are you poo pooing? Like it's, you can make seven figures net in this business if you know oh, what yeah. you're doing. And like, you know, like, oh, I'm on to bigger and better things. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, that's great for you. But like, I like this business. I, I get energy from this business. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a simple business. It's nothing crazy. I was telling my acquisitions guy, I'm like, dude, isn't this the most simple business in the world? He's like, exactly. It's just not easy. And I said, exactly. It's yeah. not easy. It's simple though. It's a very straightforward business. So um, very much so. Now the know. biggest lesson I'd say to those just starting out that are like, well, dude, I don't have experience. I haven't even done my first deal. The thing that I would, would beg that person to do is be willing to be uncomfortable to put themselves out there to ask someone experienced. Like, well, I don't that. know if I, I don't know if I'd go to the Sean Terry right away yeah. <laughs> because he might not respond to me. Cause I'm sure he's getting inundated with people asking questions, but go, go to the, as you said, uh, in a humble way earlier, go to the nobodies like you and me and, and be willing to ask us a question. You know what I mean? Yeah. Ask us a question because, Hey, guess what? Chances are someone's going to get back to you and, and, you know, fact check or give you a reality check on what's going on with that. Pro- uh, you have an ARV of 300,000, dude, no way. That's like 215. Yeah. So you might've just saved that person and vice versa on, in their shoes, just by being uncomfortable to put themselves out there and be the noob, be the rookie who's asking for a favor, who's asking to get another set of eyes. As long as you're not just like pestering with questions and stuff like that. Yeah, but like, yeah. there's an art just, doing it. Yeah, there's an art in doing it. Put yourself out there, ask the uncomfortable question because would you rather be uncomfortable asking the questions or uncomfortable losing $50,000? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you're wholesaling, because that wholesaling is getting all this crap now because people are locking up deals that don't make sense. I always answer people's messages. I got no problem, especially if they like email me. That's like my preferred uh, communication style. It's like someone emails me. Like I had a guy email the other day about a property and I'm like, oh yeah, here's the numbers. This is what I think we pay for. We make this much money. It takes me three minutes to respond and, and probably made the guy's freaking day. Right. And if we do business together, great. If we don't, that's all good. You know, it doesn't really... Yeah. It, I, I, I'm, I, it, it's cool to be able to give back, right? Because we've all started there. We've all been there. Oh, yeah. We've been rookies. You know, we've been like scraping by to get a deal. And uh, it's always good to be able to give back. That's why I like doing this podcast. So Dean, as we start to conclude the show, I, you know, I, I've been following you on Instagram for a while. And I, I can tell that one of your favorite marketing strategies or channels is doing JV deals with other investors, which is pretty much going in sync with what we just discussed. So yeah. how does your company, Home Helpers Group, you know, how, how can you work with other investors local in the uh, in the Fresno Bakers, was that what is it called? The Central Valley, the Central Valley, in the Central Valley area, because you, you you really add a lot of value with the whole entire investing community there, and we know a lot of the same people like Stratton and yep. some of those guys. So they they always got great things to say about you. Thanks, man. Yeah. So uh, first things first, I, I just know that over the years, um, I've talked about this before, just the whole idea of, of having the right mindset. So when I first got started, you know, I'm sure like a lot of people, they get into the business because they got big goals, big dreams. They're very driven, um, self-motivated. And a a lot of that comes from trying to prove things to themselves, maybe prove things to Mm -hmm. other people. So you kind of guard your, your feelings and your pride, you wrap all that up and kind of build like an ego. And, um, and a lot of that results in a, a kind of a scarcity mindset. Um, yep. In the sense that like, it's going to be me against the world. Like I'm going to show all you people. So I'm going to go out there. I'm going to bust my ass. I'm going to, 
I'm going to get deals done, make a bunch of money and, you know, I'll show you guys. So when I first got started, that was kind of my mindset. Um, even though like I was always professional and respectful and did things the right way, always, 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 but I was very kind of closed in and, and didn't reach out to a lot of people. Well, you know, flash forward, uh, a handful of years ago, um, I realized, Hey, you know what? These guys aren't my competition. I, I should be working with some of these guys. Like I, I come up, I come up against these guys in deals where the seller's like, Oh yeah. You know, I'm talking to blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah, too. And I'm like, Oh, I know those guys. Yeah. Those, those guys are great guys. You know, here's, here's what I can say about us, right. Focus on us. Cause we're not there to bash other people. So totally. Love we that. hang up the phone and call that other person. Hey, yo, dude, I just heard your name on the other, on the other line with the seller. Let's work this deal together. Let's, let's not bid each other up. It doesn't make any sense. Only one of us is going to win. So how about I take lead and you, you sit back, we'll split the deal and you know, you talk us up. Oh yeah. Those guys are great type of thing. So dude, that I love that. Happened. So my mindset started opening and starting to see other people. This is while I'm, you know, still handling acquisitions. Yeah. But then we got our acquisitions manager in and I, I was able to focus on more relationships. So as I started building more relationships and having a different perspective, I kept seeing new wholesalers, experienced wholesalers, new and old investors, realtors. And we started getting more and more referral business as people kind of knew who we were at. And I was like, dude, this referral business is dope. You know, getting free deals from people is awesome. We're spending a bunch on marketing, but this free stuff is cool. So then, you know, it kind of evolved into realizing, hey, we're, we've got a lot of experience. You know, we, we know how to handle tough, difficult situations with the seller, um, with the property, and we're pretty darn competent and efficient in getting these deals done. And then as we shifted focus from doing tons of flips to primarily wholesaling um, two years ago, we started to develop really good buyers, like really good buyers, and um, kind of became known as the it guys when it comes to buyers. So to kind of wrap all that up as, as the abundance mindset has grown and realize it's way more fun doing deals with other people and totally. providing value to them. Like the more value you provide, the more comes back to you. Totally, bro. It, I love it's, that. It's the law of attraction, man. I mean, the more that you're just putting good energy out there that you're helping other people, there's no doubt there's a law of attraction that just comes back to you. And it feels good feels good for everybody. So what we've been able to basically do is I've coined it the friends with benefits program. And, um, essentially I'm a big fan of that program. <laughs> yeah. It's a good program besides real estate. <laughs> real estate too. is cool. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> so I've, I realized, uh, you know, the friends with benefits program is essentially this. It's if you have a lead or a deal that you've locked up, regardless of the scenario, even just a qualified lead, we're willing to contact the seller, have conversations, negotiate, go on an appointment, get it under contract. Once we've done all that, we're willing then to find the buyer who's willing to pay top, top, top dollar and handle the whole escrow process and literally make it extremely easy. So imagine if you're new, and you're fumbling over this deal. You just know they want to sell. You're going to screw it up. I'm able to give you the confidence on what numbers are going to make the deal a good deal. I'm also able to negotiate on your behalf with the seller, get it locked up under contract, give the seller confidence that we're actually going to close it because a lot of new yeah. people will screw up the deal because they're like, show me a proof of funds. And they're like, uh. oh, can I go on living home? And then he's like, it's showing them yeah. some bullshit bank letter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So That's funny. Um, we can do all this stuff to provide some legitimacy and confidence in the deal. And then we're going to not only do that, but we're also going to sell it to a buyer who's arguably one of the, the top paying buyers in the whole valley and going to get you the most amount of money, probably way more money that you would have made, even if you did it on your own, right? You might've screwed up the deal, not even gotten to that point to get it under contract, let alone the fact we're going to also sell it for a real premium price. That buyer is so happy to pay because it works for them and they're a repeat buyer for us. 
So we've, we've basically, you know, got the front end taken care of the back end. And also if you have a deal, you happen to have a deal already under contract, chances are we're going to sell it way higher. I've had this happen where they're like, Hey, I had a buyer back out. You know, I saw your friends with benefits deal. You know, I'd like to give it a try. And we like blow them out of the water. We sell it above and beyond what they thought and made more money than what they would have made with their previous buyer. And that's after yep. splitting it in half. So, yep. you know, I feel like we've added a ton of value for a lot of people and we're working with experienced investors too. So experienced investors, they're like, Hey, you know what? I got these leads coming in. You guys got it figured out for me. I just press a button. My marketing goes out. The leads come in. I give it to home helpers group. They handle the rest. And I've got this automated system to where they've now removed having to hire additional employees, put in the additional work, handling the whole escrow process. They've just eliminated so much cost for the for putting a deal together, including their time. And now they've automated a money machine for themselves. So we've done that for experienced investors as well. Which is- I know a guy who moved to Florida who used to live in Fresno, and I'm pretty sure he does that. Yeah. Yeah. And then Stratton's, I mean, it's just, it's such a, it makes sense too, because everyone's trying to scale their business. You guys have the infrastructure in place to pump out these deals. So for someone banging their head against the wall while running a business, they could give you the leads, get half the profit with zero real energy and effort. And it, it makes sense for both parties. It's just such a smart idea, man. So I, you got to get that, that domain friends with benefits, rei.com. Cause I'm sure the other one's a little fucking weird. So I'd avoid the first domain. If you're listening to this and you go there, I'm not taking responsibility for what you might see. Uh, so man, this has been a lot of fun. I, uh, I really uh, enjoyed our conversation today. If people are listening and they're in the Fresno central Valley area, what's the best way for them to, you know, number one, connect with you. Number two, check you out on YouTube. Cause I want to talk about that. And then number three, get involved in the friends with benefits REI program. Yeah. Yeah. So first and foremost, if someone wants to connect with me, the easiest way is just go on Instagram. So go to Dean Rogers, real estate, just search Dean Rogers, real estate. That's my handle on Instagram. And uh, you'll find me right there. Um, YouTube is fun, man. It's just exactly what you're doing where you just, you're talking with other people who are doing cool stuff and, um, and trying to provide some value for people. So I started the YouTube channel just recently if you just go search Dean Rogers and YouTube, you'll find me in there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if people want to get involved with the friends and benefits program, just go, go to Instagram, Dean Rogers, real estate, shoot me a DM and we'll connect and we'll, we'll get things going, man. I love it. And I see Dean's stories all the time. He's every Friday he's got, it's like closing Friday and he's got all these PayPal's he's send it. He's legit. I, I really, uh, if you're in that market, this is, this could be a tremendous opportunity to, to, to make some, some, some money with your deals. So Dean, man, this is awesome. We'll make sure we got all this in the show notes and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day, bro. This was a lot of fun. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to another episode of pave the way podcast. We hope you got value from today's episode. Make sure you download Greg's free guide on daily personal productivity for free at www.pavetheday.com. That's pave the day spelled D-A-Y dot com. If you have any questions or want to reach out, head over to www.pavethewaypodcast.com. We'll see you on the next episode.